Hello my peers, this is Foss, Australian for beer and American for your parents really didn't love you. And today is Theatrical Thursday. Theatrical Thursday is the day of the week where we talk about all sorts of things from across the theater or we just do some theatrical improv games. It's all about dramatization and the like. Today we're going to be talking about analyzing what you say and how it's going to change your acting. When you encounter certain plays, sometimes they can be difficult, sometimes they can be daunting, for the simple fact of they use such complicated, intricate language. So we got here, <clears throat> Galileo, which is very much known for its intricate language. I was in this show um, at a community college, and it was pretty much a snore fest at first. Um, the more we got into it, the more we started to understand it, the more we were able to bring to the show and make it a lot better. And so I want to talk to you about the kind of stuff that we had to go through, and that's look at individual sentences. I'm going to read you verbatim the monologue that is at the very end of the show. Um, the only spoilers are historical facts about Galileo. So, I guess spoiler warning? I don't know. All right. All right, so first, there's this dialogue back and forth between Galileo and his previous student, Andrea. And Andrea basically says, uh, science is not concerned with our weaknesses. And Galileo is basically saying that he has failed science. No? My dear Saudi, in spite of my present convictions, I may be able to give you a few pointers as to your chosen profession. In my spare time, I happen to have gone over this case. I have spare time. I happen to... Uh, tr -tr -tr Even a man who sells wool, however good he is at buying wool cheap and selling a deer, must be concerned with the standing of the wool trade. The practice of science would seem to call for valor. She trades in knowledge which is the product of doubt, and this new art of doubt has enchanted the public. The plight of the multitude is as old as the rocks, and believed to be as basic as the rocks, but now they have learned to doubt. They snatch the telescopes out of our hands, and have trained them on their tormentors. Prince, official, public moralist, and the mechanism of the heavens was clear, but the mechanism of the courts was still murky. The battle to measure the Roman... and you can see where I'm going with this, right? Okay, <laughs> we're gonna slow down, because I can't do that. Um, we're gonna slow it down, and we're gonna talk about this bit by bit. Okay, so, what's the first sentence? No? My dear Sarti, in spite of my present convictions, I may be able to give you a few pointers as to your chosen profession. So what do we do here? Well, we think about Galileo, we think about what happened to him. He was almost tortured. Um, he was shown the instruments of torture, and that's when he said, I don't want to be tortured. In fact, that's actually the most time that you're going to get. Um, the most effective information from torture is from that panic of it's about to happen. So this was this was panic, this was self-doubt, this was fear, and he was he was almost tortured just for saying that the Earth uh, revolved around the Sun and not the other way around. Because up till that point, everybody believed that the Sun revolved around the Earth, and there was biblical lines that were quoted. Um, basically about the sun rising and setting, and so how can it do that if it does not move, that kind of thing. And so, it, w it was, yeah. So basically, he was put away and put on house arrest after this. He's living a miserable existence because of this. And so, when he says, no, my dear Sardi, this is going to be anger, and so really with each sentence we need to put it in the context of the character, into the context of the show, and into the context of the dialogue itself. The dialogue itself, that one's going to be obvious, but the rest is going to take a little bit of know-how, a little bit of research. Alright, so, rather than saying, no my dear Sardi, this is angry. This is self, self-hate needs to show here, so, no. My dear Saudi, in spite of my present convictions, I may be able to give you a few pointers as to your chosen profession. So more like that. Okay, moving on down the line. Um, now we have Virginia enter. Now basically what has been happening here is that he, is, he has given up science. He was forced to give up science before this moment. And so now he, he has to basically shut down completely. And so because Virginia enters, that's what it does. In my spare time, I happen to have gone over this case. I ha 
that spare time. And so now everything that he says from this point on is code because he's not allowed to be talking about this stuff, but he's still going to. And there's a certain amount of defeatism in having to talk about code. He wants to talk about this openly. He wants there to be a discussion. He wants to enlighten people, but he can't. So that needs to be felt every single time. All right, so the next line is, even a man who sells wool, however good he is at buying it cheap and selling it dear, must be concerned with the standing of the wool trade. The practices of science would seem to call for valor. She trades in knowledge, which is the product of doubt. Okay, so backing up a little bit, um, the wool line. Now, on the surface, this is talking about someone who, think like a stockbroker, basically. Someone who is good at buying stocks when they're low and selling them high, making tons of money off of it. But even stockbrokers have to be concerned with the overall stock exchange, because if that plummets, there's no money to be made. That's the idea. And in reference to science, well, he's saying, no matter how good you are at buying it cheap and selling it dear, no matter how good you are at your job, you have to be concerned with its overall effectiveness. Even if you are the most rational person alive, you still have to be able to convince people. They still have to be willing to learn and listen to science. And that's, that's what it is. So with that in mind, even a man who sells wool, however good he is at buying wool cheap and selling it dear, must be concerned with the standing of the wool trade. Right. And then it says, she trades in knowledge, that's the idea of science. All right. So the practice of science would seem to call for valor. She trades in knowledge, which is the product of doubt. Here's a good line. Alright, I, they're just they're chock full of these. Alright, she trades in knowledge which is the product of doubt. This is the idea of, I'm not entirely certain about something, so I'm going to test this. And it is because of these testing of hypotheses that we even have the scientific method. That we have evidence for what we believe now. This was the birth of that. This was the idea of making absolute certain that you were correct. And that's, that's going to involve tests that can be replicated and duplicated. So yeah, it's it, basically science is the product of doubt. It is looking at something and saying, I do not know this thoroughly enough. I want to find out more. I want to learn more. I want to make a theory and then test it to see if the theory is correct. Yeah, or the hypothesis. Sorry, the hypothesis is correct. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Terminology is actually... I wasn't very good at science, but anyway. The practice of science would seem to call for valor. She trades in knowledge, which is the product of doubt. And this new art of doubt has enchanted the public. Now, you see that change there. Enchanted the public. This is, this is the most important part of acting. You see where the moods change. Now, enchanted, it's a very positive word. It's a very positive word, and there's no negativity here because he's talking about the people are finally listening, the people are finally understanding. And so even though he's locked up at home, maybe, just maybe, things will do better. Okay, or people will do better. All right. And this new art of doubt has enchanted the public. The plight of the multitude is as old as the rocks and is believed to be as basic as the rocks. Again, we have to analyze this. Alright, so what could he possibly be? The plight of the multitude is as old as the rocks and believed is as basic as the rocks, but now they have learned to doubt. Okay. Again, this is talking about anytime there is new knowledge, it is always met with resistance. And it's believed to be as basic as, here's this new thought, and the people who disagree with the new thought, despite that there being evidence for the new thought, are wrong. Look at today, we have global warming, um, and even though 90% of scientists all agree that it's real, most people just don't think it is whatsoever. So that kind of thing. 
or not most people, but many, many people still believe it's just a hoax for some reason. All right, moving on down. But now they have learned to doubt. They snatched the telescopes out of our hands and had them trained on their uh, tormentors. Prince, official, public moralist. All right, so what does a telescope do? A telescope enhances sight. It allows you to see things clearer from farther away. It's binoculars, basically. Um, and people, people at first were using the telescope not to look at the stars, but to look at each other. It was, it was actually sold, Galileo sold this idea in the earlier part of the play as a weapon, because you could see the enemy f a good five hours before they were at your doorstep and you could have time to prepare yourself. That kind of thing. Okay, but it says they have trained them on their tormentors. That means that with this doubt, with all this idea, they learned to start not only doubting the science around them, because, you know, people thought that there was no infinite space, people thought there was a crystal shell, they started to doubt that the sun revolved around the earth. But not only that, they started to doubt the people in power who were telling them this stuff repeatedly. They were learning to educate themselves. This was entirely new back then. A lot of people didn't, didn't care. A lot of people couldn't afford education. Anyway. They snatched the telescopes out of our hands and trained them on their tormentors. Prince, official public moralist, and the mechanism of the heavens was clear, but the mechanism of their courts was still murky. The battle to measure the heavens is won by doubt. The battle for religion, whether, whether religion can tell people to stay ignorant or not, basically, is won by doubt. If we, if we are allowed to have doubts, if we are allowed to explore those doubts, the truth will show up. Alright, moving on. By credulity, the Romans' housewife's battle for milk will always be lost. This one's an interesting one, because it's not entirely self-explanatory. <laughs> I could be wrong here, but I believe what he's talking about is that through credulity, which is apprehensiveness, basically, um, if, if you are not bold, you will lose milk, you will not be fruitful, you will not get what you're seeking. If we try to go inch by inch, little by little, then there's going to be too much pushback, and all of, our, all of our efforts will be lost. We need to take great leaps, sometimes. Okay. Word is passed down that this is of no concern to the scientist. That one is self-explanatory. That is that all of this means nothing to the scientists because the scientists should just be able to do science and that's it. No. As we move on. Who is told he will only release such of his findings that as do not disturb the peace. That is the peace of mind of the well-to-do. And now we have something completely different. Now people are saying only release science that people are comfortable with only release science that does not shake anyone's worldview whatsoever. And at the time, this actually made people lose faith in God. Which is not good, in my opinion, even as an atheist. Anyway, moving on down the line. Threats and bribes fill the air. And can the scientists hold out against the numbers? That one's also self-explanatory. People, people bribing to stay quiet, people threatening to stay quiet. What is the cost of your morality? What is the cost, or, or what would you have to lose to hold up your morality? What would you be willing to lose to still be moral? That's a very intense question. Okay. For what reason do you labor? Again, it's along the same lines. What reason is there stack up against all those threats and bribes. If it's just for money, you're going to be susceptible to any bribe. If it's just, if it's your, if you hold your life most important, well, that could be lost too. It's, it's intense. This play is very intense. All right. I take it that the intent of science is to ease human existence. 
if you give way to coercion, science can be crippled, and your new machines may simply suggest new drudgeries. Again, we analyze, we look, we see. This has gone on for a while, so I'm going to end it there. But I just want you to think about this when you're approaching a new play, usually ones that are pretty complicated, because the complicated ones, the ones that have fancy wording, shall we say, such as Romeo and Juliet, such as uh, Brecht, um, you're gonna have a lot of difficulty at first, but man, I mean, just listening to that versus what we started with, you can get so much information through first. Understanding what's happening in the dialogue, understanding what words are being spoken, two, putting it in context of the character um, in terms of that scene, and three, putting it in context of the character for what they believe, what they feel, that might not even be in the script at all. Alright, thank you for watching guys, like if you like, share with your friends, subscribe if you want to see more theatrical uh, stuff. We got, we got one more of these coming up next Thursday, and then we got a whole bunch of improv coming your way. So stay tuned. Love you guys. Have a good night and a good life.